Alright guys, Dominic here for Kit Guru, and today we are checking out our first ever water-cooled 40 series card. That's right, it's the MSI RTX 4090 Supreme Liquid X. Using a 240mm all-in-one to cool the AD102 should result in excellent thermal performance, plus this card is also featuring dual BIOS, a custom PCB, and a 105MHz factory overclock. Today then, we're going to find out exactly how good this card really is. Kicking things off then with a look at the design of the card, the first thing to know is that MSI is using a hybrid approach when it comes to cooling. That means the GPU and memory are cooled by the 240mm all-in-one, but there is also a 100mm Torx 5.0 fan on the card itself, and this blows air over the VRMs and the rest of the PCB. Speaking of the shroud, I have to say I do really like what MSI has done here. The Supreme range as a whole generally does have quite a classy look, and things are no different for the Liquid X. We can see a really nice two-tone grey aesthetic for the shroud, and while it is made from plastic, there is a brushed metal plate screwed on top, which does help to give it more of a premium look and feel. We can also find three RGB zones on the card. These do default to white LEDs out of the box, but this is of course customizable within MSI Center, and I personally opted for a synchronized effect with the rest of my fans and RGB memory. It may also sound a little bit odd at first, but I actually think one of the positives to getting an AIO card is the fact that it's actually gonna be a bit more compact Obviously, you do need to factor in the 240mm radiator, but most cases will support that. And if we look at the actual dimensions of the card itself, it is a lot smaller than some of the other custom 4090s we have reviewed. Whereas some of those cars actually come in over 30cm long and they're a triple slot thickness, the Supreme Liquid X measures 280 by 140 by 43mm. So maybe if your case isn't super deep or you really need to access the expansion slot below your GPU so you can't have a triple slot card, then this could be something to consider. In keeping with the shroud design, we can also find a lovely two-tone metal backplate and that is complete with the supreme hexagonal kind of triangular logo towards the end of the card. Just next to the power connector as well, we find the dual BIOS switch with a choice between the gaming and silent modes. The gaming BIOS is the default out of the box and this does offer a higher power limit of 480 watts. You also get a higher clock speed and a more aggressive fan curve, but rest assured, we of course will test both of these modes later in the video. The power connector itself is of course the new standard, the 12VHPWR. The MSI does actually include a quad 8-pin adapter in the box. And we can also see standard display outputs with three DisplayPort 1.4 and one HDMI 2.1. As for the radiator then, this is a standard 240mm unit and it measures 27mm thick though the fans are actually 27.5 millimeters thick, so you'll need about 56 millimeters of clearance. Speaking of the fans, these are MSI's Silent Gale units, which, if you ask me, is a very strange name, but they do get the job done. I also love the fact that they use standard four pin PWM headers and they connect to this small bit of exposed cabling. So that is really good news if you want to swap these out for another third party option. Just be aware that as they are 27.5 millimeters thick instead of the standard 25 millimeters thickness, that MSI reckons you will need to use slightly shorter screws, otherwise you might puncture the radiator fins. MSI told us that the standard Acetec AIO screws that you might get with whatever AIO unit you have, they should work fine, but they are not included in the box. The radiator tubes themselves measure 47 centimeters in length, so that should be fine for most. And I also appreciate the fact that MSI actually hid almost all of the fan cabling within the sleeving itself. 
One thing that could be better though is the tubing's exit point from the card itself. So the card actually measures 140 millimeters tall, but as you can see here, the tubing actually exits straight out of the side of the card and you can't really bend it for at least four to five centimeters. So depending how wide your case actually is, you might end up with a bit of pressure or compression on the tubing itself. I'm actually using the MSI Velox 100p airflow case, which is a pretty standard mid tower at 231 millimeters wide. And while I could get the side panel on and closed, it was definitely putting pressure on the tubing. Having rotary right angle fittings on the side of the card really would have been ideal here as I think the tubing needs to be going upwards and not outwards. Now I do also have a couple of thoughts on the radiator installation. So by default, the two fans are actually installed to the underside or I guess the tube side of the radiator. So it makes sense that the radiator would be installed in the roof of your case with the two fans on the underside exhausting air in a push configuration. I definitely think that is the best way to do it. But even with that being said, I think it's completely baffling that MSI actually only includes four of the short screws that you're meant to mount the radiator to your case with. I mean, it would probably be fine, but is this really something you want to be risking? I just think it's very poor from MSI considering this is an RTX 4090 that costs over 2000 pounds to only get half the amount of radiator screws. I just don't understand that. So while I definitely would recommend installing this AIO in the roof of your case, I already have a 360 millimeter all-in-one for my CPU in our GPU test system, so it wasn't really worth the hassle of moving everything around. With that in mind then, I wanted to flip the fans over and install the radiator at the front of the case with the fans acting as intakes. But in doing so, I actually noticed something pretty interesting. Basically, due to the rubber anti-vibration mounts, the actual screw holes on the fans themselves are slightly recessed. This meant I wasn't able to mount the fans to the radiator on the inside of the case, as when I passed the screws through the front panel and then through the fan, the screws weren't actually long enough to protrude past the fan and into the radiator. If, however, I tried to mount the fans on the outside of the front panel, then the screws can sit more or less flush against the fans and this way they still protrude past the fan by a few millimeters allowing me to screw them into the radiator now to be clear i'm not saying this is a big deal as the optimal setup for this cooler is definitely to have the radiator mounted in the roof with the fans on the underside pushing hot air out if, however, for whatever reason, like me, you do want to flip the fans over, so either the radiators at the front with the fans pushing air in, or even with the radiator still in the roof, you might want to flip the fans over so they're now in a pull configuration. In that scenario, you will actually find that the fans may not mount to the radiator due to the length of the screws and the anti-vibration rubber mounts. The easy fix here then would just be MSI including a second set of screws, which are just a couple of millimeters longer, something AlphaCool actually does with its radiators. It's definitely only a smaller detail and it might not even affect that many people, but I still think for a product of this price, you would like to think that all possibilities had been thought of. Moving on though, it's finally time to check out the PCB where we can see MSI is using a custom design. In fact, it's got a monster 26 phase VRM for the GPU and a four phase VRM for the memory controlled by the monolithic power systems MP2891. We can also see that 70 amp monolithic MP86957 MOSFETs are used across the design. As for the cooler then, MSI is using a copper base plate here and this contacts with both the GPU and the VRAM with the heat of course being drawn away by the all-in-one cooler. The VRMs however contact with a black secondary heatsink and this is cooled by the fan on the shroud. We can also see that MSI is using thermal pads on the back plate which does just help to draw out extra heat 
from the back of the memory modules and the MOSFETs. So that is it for our look at the car, the cooler and the overall design. And now it's time to move on to testing. For this, we are of course using our regular GPU test system for 2022, and this is powered by MSI. This system uses Intel's i9-12900K processor, paired with the MSI MEG Z690 Unify motherboard, and we also have 32GB of a Data XPG Lancer DDR5 memory clocked at 6000MHz. All testing was also done using the MSI MPG321 URQD 4K monitor. Kicking things off then with a look at the GPU thermals, here we are of course testing both the gaming and the silent BIOS modes. As expected, the Supreme Liquid X does deliver the best thermal results of any RTX 4090 so far, with the GPU hitting 60.3 degrees using the gaming BIOS, while it's about 3 degrees warmer when using the silent BIOS. There is, however, a slightly larger delta between the GPU and the hotspot temperatures than what we have come to expect, with the hotspot temperatures themselves aren't being much, if any better, than the other cards we've tested. Now, they're definitely not bad, but this sort of thing does make us wonder about either the flatness of the copper base plate or possibly the mounting pressure of the AIO onto the GPU die. In a similar fashion, the GDDR6X thermals are definitely higher than what we'd expect, with the silent BIOS hitting 82 degrees compared to 78 degrees for the gaming BIOS, making these results higher than both the Palit GameRock OC and the Inno 3D X3 OC. Now, we did actually ask MSI about this and they told us our results are in line with their internal figures. And it actually seems that the higher temperatures could be a result of the AIO block not flowing liquid directly over the memory modules. Rather, the memory contact zones are actually raised slightly from the copper base plate and of course, they're also out to the side. Again, to be clear, these results are still perfectly fine and well within safe limits, but for a liquid cooled card, we would have expected better. Noise levels though is an area where the Supreme Liquid X does very well. Using the gaming BIOS, we saw noise levels hit 37 dBA and this dropped by 2 dBA using the silent BIOS as that mode of course has a more relaxed fan curve, both for the radiator fans and for the fan on the card itself. That said, however, I did unfortunately notice a bit of coil whine in certain situations, and this was also exacerbated when I overclocked the card. It's definitely not terrible, but have a quick listen for yourself. Moving on though, to look at our noise normalized GPU temperatures, once we increase fan speed to hit 40 dBA, we can see the best noise normalized thermal results yet, with the Supreme Liquid X keeping the GPU about 5 degrees cooler than the Palette GameRock OC. The hotspot temperature is still running a bit warmer however, coming in just shy of 70 degrees. Likewise, for the memory modules, a noise normalized result of 74 degrees makes this warmer than both of the air-cooled AIB cards we have tested, though it is still an improvement over the Founders Edition. Moving on then to a quick look at total system power draw, we can see the Supreme Liquid X is drawing a bit more than the competition due to its 480 watt power limit when using the gaming BIOS. It's hardly a big difference and the silent BIOS does actually reduce the power limit back down to 450 watts, where we can see total system power draw in line with the competition. Using the gaming BIOS though, with its increase to power draw, as well as the 105 MHz overclock, does actually make this the fastest running RTX 4090 we have tested so far. Over our 30 minute stress test, it averaged 2,820 megahertz using the gaming BIOS and 2,760 megahertz using the silent BIOS. So both results are clear of the next best in a 3D X3 OC. Even with that being said, the gains from that extra clock speed are limited. In the five games we benchmarked at 4K, 
At most, the Supreme Liquid X came in 4% faster than the Founders Edition, but in other cases, it was just 2 to 3% ahead. As we've already said, these differences just aren't really noticeable when you're actually playing games, as in terms of frame rates, all 4090s are going to deliver basically the same gaming experience. We did also overclock the Supreme Liquid X though using MSI Afterburner and in fairness it did do pretty well. We were able to increase the power limit up to a maximum of 530 watts and we added 180MHz to the GPU and 1650MHz to the memory. This brought up the average clock speed to exactly 3GHz giving it a very slender lead over the Founders Edition. That played out in the games we tested as well with the overclock netting an extra 6-7% to performance versus stock. It's fine overall and to be honest exactly what we've come to expect from the 4090. Overall then I have to say that the MSI RTX 4090 Supreme Liquid X is a bit of a mixed bag being highly impressive in some areas but in others it just left me scratching my head. I do love the sleek and clean design while the AIO cooler offers impressive thermals and very low noise levels, especially if you use the silent BIOS. That said, memory thermals are actually a bit worse than some of the air-cooled cards we've tested, while the delta between the GPU and the hotspot temperatures does also suggest that either the cold plate flatness or the mounting pressure could be improved. We already mentioned the screw situation as well earlier in the video, which I think is just poor attention to detail. For starters, we only get four of the shorter screws to mount the radiator to the roof, and if you actually want to flip the fans over, but still keep them on the inside of your case, the fan screws aren't even long enough to mount through the fan and into the radiator. Pricing is also a contentious topic. Now, if you are in the US, there is a lot more to like here, as the MSRP is set at $1,749. After a little bit of a drama, MSI US did confirm that. Over here, however, MSI UK told us that the MSRP is actually £2,180, which is a 26% price premium over NVIDIA's baseline MSRP. Now, of course, I do get that the currency exchange rate isn't particularly good at the moment, but even taking that into account, plus 20% VAT, we're definitely getting a bad deal compared to the US. Ultimately, if you do want an RTX 4090, then there is still a lot to like about the Supreme Liquid X, but Equally, in my opinion, I think there's just a few too many question marks around the design, all just small details that could be improved, and at this price, I really would be expecting near perfection. Anyway guys, that is going to do it for this video, so if you liked it, please do toss me a thumbs up, and as always, let me know your thoughts down in the comments below. You can also subscribe if you haven't already, and ding that notification so you won't miss out on any of our videos. We'd also love to come have you chat with us on our Discord server, which is linked in the description. And while you're there, you can also find links to our merch store. And if you're feeling particularly generous, you could even consider backing us on Patreon. That is it for this one though, guys. I'm Dominic Guru, and I'll see you in the next video.